fiction, a short story. Into the depths of the earth I descended when suddenly I came upon her apparition. She walked alongside the graveyard near the area her captors once lived. It was not her ghost, but was her living being, wearing a forever stained but recently washed white t-shirt and blue jeans with holes below the knees. She walked anxiously, almost running, to attract as little attention as possible, as if trying to quickly gain distance. Her eyes glowing white, fixed wide like two full moons staring ahead undeviatingly as I pitted my car to the curb, rolled down the passenger window and asked if she needed help. Her plastered eyes never noticing my frantic detour as she rushed on and quickly vanished amidst a straight dash seeming to evaporate in my rearview mirror just moments after she passed. I returned home where some people had conspicuously assembled outside my house. Trespassers on my property had become all too common, and this time it was a Latino woman in the passenger seat of a driverless car and her restless child standing in the back. They spoke no English until I asked if they knew the troubled woman I'd just seen, pointing to the nearby graveyard. The woman hushed her child, nodded yes, then shared a name which caused me much concern. I grabbed my cane and drove quickly back towards the graveyard and began circling all nearby streets. Everyone I saw appeared to be hiding something. Had I been able to penetrate beyond her frozen stare, perhaps I could have saved her. But even then, had her memory and childhood identity been erased, in any case, how would I go about reintroducing her to her family after so many years? As familiar as I am with the area, after searching a few side streets and alleyways, I pulled into a parking lot behind a warehouse and realized I'd never seen this place before, despite being only several blocks from my house. Just then her captors appeared. They looked as though they were still searching for her. I was unarmed and stepped out from my car with my cane, crouching into a hiding position behind the warehouse and watched as they exited their van which they parked behind a corner store. As they walked towards the front entrance, I focused my full vision upon a padlock that secured the ice box outside. Without a second guess, I steadied my concentration to free her from what I knew had already become of her. Moments before I witnessed her captors pull up, she was forced by another handler into the ice box, which had a removable floor then smuggled towards the back of the building. And just like that, I heard the van door shut from the opposite side and they were gone. After many years in captivity, she miraculously managed to escape and in a brief moment appeared to me as a living ghost. A droning metallic heaviness overcame me as my thoughts anchored into the hopelessness of ever again having this opportunity. For a couple years up to this moment, the lost girl had managed to reach me regularly with a kind of subtle, blanketing thought intrusiveness, like abstract poetic sheaths and generally in the mornings. But I, like everyone else, had taken it for granted that she was still alive. After all, several famous books had been written about her murder, which supposedly happened 30 plus years ago. Naturally, I had always assumed it was her angel that was speaking to me in the mornings, not a living human with such mobility of thought to be able to reach another at an extreme distance as if by a telephone. Maybe she'd been held captive nearby this whole time. The town would be up in arms over such a breakthrough, as the grief never fully ceased since the tragedy occurred. But, in conclusion, I felt as though I must not have correctly interpreted those special thought communications, having let her slip away upon my opportunity to rescue her. Mornings have been quiet ever since.